We're going to come back here. We will reconvene the council meeting. And I believe, let's see here. Councilmember Foley spoke. We are on to Councilmember Candelas. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I, I appreciate um, not just the opportunity to come back after dinner, energize, and, 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 and talk about, you know, uh, the, your budget message, but I think it was important important to hear on 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 your priorities, including addressing homelessness, uh, creating safer streets, and enhancing our neighborhoods throughout the city. Public safety, homelessness, and clean neighborhoods are important to our residents. Uh, but I also believe we can move this city forward um, as we look to address the challenges necessary before we can strengthen our community. Um, I want to ensure that we, as a council, have all the information uh, before we make decisions on the budget. Um, as Vice Mayor Kamei said earlier, what, you know, what are their trade-offs um, as, as we deliberate the programs being proposed? Um, and, you know, as we look to provide a, a, a wide breadth of housing solutions, it's important that we continue to support key initiatives uh, while also exploring other op opportunities. Uh, the community plan and homelessness specifically mentions the multiple strategies needed uh, to execute um, and, 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 and have our approach to uh, solving the, the unhoused um, uh, issue. I look forward to getting through our current pipeline of projects. Uh, these projects are important, but the fact is, you know, the fact remains that we need more permanent housing. Um, paired with immediate solutions, we can all agree that the de this development takes time for a multitude of reasons. Uh, I'm also excited to explore further opportunities for affordable housing development, uh, ho affordable housing developments and how will we keep funding for this? Uh, through this specific recommendation, I'm hoping that we can put a numerical context behind our housing crisis and look at the funding landscape for current as well as prospective affordable housing developments. Um, that, you know, that being said, Councilmember Davis, would you be open to a friendly amendment to include recommendation, recommendation number three in my memorandum as an MBA uh, to ensure we get the cost for the trade-offs I specifically mentioned? Yes, I'm happy to accept that as an amendment. Awesome, uh, thank you. And you know, as, as we have this conversation on the budget, I, I also don't wanna lose sight of programs like early education and family learning um, that, our residents, depend on, that de our residents depend on. Library programming, expanding Sunday hours to all branch library locations and maintaining scholarship uh, for recreation programs and education services are a critical piece of what we do as a city. Um, these programs have shown that they help improve youth performance at school and reduce crime and juvenile delinquency. Uh, providing a full range of programming will have a significant return on investment for the city. Um, and um, a lack, like, I would like to thank my colleagues for their, for their mem memorandums as they, they pertain to these family services. Uh, you know, one of the budget messages focuses is, is public safety. Uh, recreational programs are the best investment to prevent our youth from ending up in the system and in the worst case on the streets. Um, as this council looks to discuss numerous programs and services, uh, I'd like to ensure that we are providing ample mental health services for youth, especially as our recreation centers and programs are oftentimes the, the main mechanism for which youth are engaged outside of school. Um, you know, the re research shows that surrounding youth uh, with, with proper support can help our youth uh, now and in the future. Uh, poor mental health leads to poor academic performance and ultimately poor decision making. Um, we should strengthen existing partnerships and programs in place and, and I see that you mentioned that in your memorandum and, and, and I, 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 I'm excited to, to see what comes out of that. Um, early intervention and read, readiness as opposed to reactive services uh, where treatment is far more expensive uh, for, it's for, for, for both the city and, and the individual. So. Um, uh, as this budget process unfolds, I look forward to the conversations and, uh, and to coordinating and working with my colleagues on, on a budget for, for all in our city. Thank you. Thank you, council member. And just to clarify, the friendly amendment suggestion was uh, recommendation three to be turned into an MBA. And I, I heard a yes from council member Davis and a second. Did, I, did we get a second? Duan, are you comfortable with the friendly amendment? I'm okay with it. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, we are now back around for a second round of comments and we will go to Council Member Torres. Great, thank you, Mayor. Uh, 
So this is uh, the process where we are realizing that uh, we have to, people are uh, watching us uh, make the sausage, right? So uh, did I say that one right? Maybe not. <laughs> did I? Okay. <laughs> anyway, since uh, we are, we, the, the items that I proposed in, in my memo uh, are, are also extremely important, not only for myself, but to other uh, members in our community. Uh, and, I, and I wholeheartedly uh, appreciate the process that we're in. I think this is uh, extremely important uh, because we, we are definitely prioritizing uh, the needs of our, uh, of our community and, and, and our residents. So, so uh, one, I want uh, just a clarification with the friendly amendment that Council Member Kamei, shoot, sorry, Vice Mayor Kamei uh, offered, which is, uh, the MBAs was so that there was no amendment accepted. It was just a clarification that the the motion on the floor, which is the substitute motion, that the items that would come back uh, through an MBA would include discussion of costs, staffing needs, potential redundancies and trade offs, and and uh, staff confirm that that's those are the kinds of things that would be discussed in an MBA. Great. No and. Thank you, and, and thank you to Councilmember Davis for helping us stay on track uh, with the meeting of our, with the, you know, with meeting the needs of our residents with with her motion. So, um, so I, I would like to also offer a friendly amendment uh, where uh, the items that uh, I requested in my memo uh, that have a dollar amount uh, come back uh, as a budget addendum. I'm happy to accept that as well. Thank you. Is that okay with my secondary? Absolutely. Okay. So those are the, so now we've, we have also included, so any that have explicit direction to come back as an MBA, uh, recommendation three from the Candelis memo, and the recommendations in the Torres memo that have specific dollar amounts, that those items come back as an MBA. Okay. Uh, on to Councilman Ortiz. Thank you, uh, Mayor, and my comments are very similar to Councilmember Torres's, but specific to item number two, I wanted to see if um, we could have a friendly amendment to include item number two as a, a potential uh, MBA. Um, want to explore that as an option. Point of order, Mayor. Yes, Councilmember? I think the amendment which is uh, Councilmember Torres and Ortiz, uh, that was already accepted when we, uh, the motion which was accepted, it said all memos, now wait a second, all memos by council members which have an MBA, those items goes as MBA, what is non-MBA goes as the MBAs. So everything was converted. The, the, the motion into, on the floor uh, stated the, the the motion stated that all direction, all recommendations that explicitly asked for an MBA would be treated, would come back as such, would be kept. All other recommendations would be treated as discussion, such as in the Cohen memo. If you read the Cohen memo, it's all of it is background. It's for discussion. It's just okay. it's it's discussion okay. points. It's for our consideration. Okay. So, the, so if you look at the, the memo we're currently on, and, and Councilman Ortiz has the floor um, and is asking for a friendly amendment here. If you look at his memo, recommendation one asks for MBAs, manager budget addendum, Correct. addenda, on items A, B, C, D, E. But on number two, gives explicit direction to allocate dollars today. Right. And um, I think some of us have expressed our concern around that, though many of the ideas in here are very strong. So uh, I think the request is that, again, for items, um, well, in this case, I think the council member is asking for all those items to be considered as uh, coming back or to come back via an MBA. Yes, so Mayor, I don't have a disagreement on that, but our... I think we're getting beyond the point of information. Sorry, we'll, we'll, we can come back to you. We're saying that I'm still on the point of uh, information on that. I'm saying that our substitute motion accepted all the items to be MBA items and anything which is non-MBA is accepted as MBA item. No. No. 
That wasn't the original motion. Okay, that's that the, the wording we motion. had, but I think we may have misread it, but uh, that was the wording we prepared uh, and it was done, okay? Yeah, just, just once again, Councilor Davis stated, any of the recommendations that ask for an MBA will come back as an MBA. Any that do not would simply be for discussion, not an MBA. Just like, if you look at Councilmember Cohen's memo, there's a yeah. lot back, okay. I, I, so uh, we're now modifying that motion. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay. okay, so now to the friendly amendment. Yes. Councilmember Davis. Councilmember Ortiz, I am happy to accept your friendly amendment. Thank you so much. I'll second it. Appreciate that, just would like to explore the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, great. Now, Councilmember Batra, you have the floor. All right, uh, first of all, I wanna say that the entire process of getting this input from the public and preparation of the memos, I think a lot of people have invested a lot of very thoughtful ideas in there and modifying the here, the memo submissions and what we have finally changed the, our substitute motion to, I think it is the right way to approach our items. Since some of the items were described by other uh, council members, I'm just gonna pick on two of the items which I have submitted for MBA. One is I'm proposing that we consider our Project HOPE, which helps our communities have a better life. And we have identified, as a city of San Jose, 18 sites which are subject to that kind of a Project HOPE eligible project. But we only have Project HOPE in nine of them. And we have submitted MBA for asking it to be expended to 18. More importantly, District 10 has been doing this Project HOPE as supplemental activity, which is a council assigned person who is a retired police officer, works only with that Project HOPE site, one site in District 10. And as a result, we believe that Project HOPE activity plus what the council appointed or assigned person, a retired police officer working part-time, has really made it in the new list which came out after eight, nine years of work that the Via Monte, uh, Hoff Mia Monte is no longer on that list of the hotspots or whatever the opportunity zone terminology are we are calling. So we are drawing attention to that activity which has been done in addition to our supplementing the project hope. And we made a strong recommendation to evaluate if it will be possible within our budgets to be able to include that kind of an activity within the project hope, either from the city manager's total budget or as a supplement from the council members. So we wanted to highlight that activity because which has been very productive in making uh, one of these hot sites no longer be very hot. Uh, it's beginning to tend towards a warm and cold. Okay. The second item I like to highlight, which is very consistent with everybody else, talking about having affordable homes. Okay. Affordable homes at a fast pace and large number of them because our need is really great and having 100, 200 units come around, one project coming, finding a piece of land, then coming working with our planning department in an iterative process, taking months to get the project entitled, then working with the housing to get NOFA funds, waiting for that, then to county to give the fund, then this, get the tax credit, all of that process takes about four years to get any project to fruition. We have suggested to evaluate that if changing the process where city buys some X number of properties, does some pre-planning on it, figure out how many units can be built on that one, clear the community activity on it, figure out the environmental impact. So all of those things get taken care of before even a uh, nonprofit or a developer gets involved. Once we have that kind of information in hand, that we have a property which can build 200 units on it, and it is 
uh, met the environmental impact. It has also met the community requirements. We can get a developer or a nonprofit come out and say, okay, from NOFA, we have this many funds available for this site. Please tell us if you can build something like that. And they may make some minor tweaks. Doing that for many number of units of the property in town at one time in the city, we may be able to get no more usage of the funds than we were planning to use, but we may be able to get a large number of projects completed a lot sooner than the current process yields us. So this goes in mayor the direction of the innovation and creativity or out of the box thinking. Not sure of all the practicality issues in it, but have put it on for consideration so that we can experiment on it or actually embark on it depending upon what the city staff comes. It will have implication on how much city staff is needed, how much of the work will have to be done and a pre RFP if you want to call it. So those are the couple of projects I've highlighted in my memo, which are going for MBA, not a direction to be completed. Okay? And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get those on the list of the budget to be done. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, council member. Councilman Jimenez. Yeah, I just want to say it's wonderful to see everyone getting along. Uh, accepting recommendations and amendments. I, I, I was wondering if that was what in fact was going to happen, but it's nice to see that. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, I, I would just say I think it's also important to acknowledge that the difficult conversations are going to happen later. <laughs> uh, and I acknowledge that. I think it's important just to recognize that because there's some things in the budget message that, for example, weren't addressed as deeply as I would have liked, like say parks and things of that nature that I know Councilmember Cohen lifted up, but I, I just Wanted to express that, and uh, I'll be supportive of the message. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Council Member. Councilor Candelas, you up again? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Mayor, I just got a, a question on, on Appendix B of your budget message with regards to cost estimates for, for individual council budget documents. Um, is is the, the verbiage that each council member should submit no more than five uh, cost estimates binding or or so let me clear, yeah, thanks for the question. There's two different things I, I want to separate out. There are budget documents, which are, and we'll provide a template, essentially short memos requesting an investment. Typically, it's one time, but doesn't have to be. Typically, it's in one's district, but doesn't have to be. Typically, smaller, because the entire fund for everyone up here is on the order of $3 million. There is no limit on the number of budget documents that you send to my office. However, given, and given the <laughs> tremendous amount of work we have now just put on staff's plate to come back with detailed MBAs on, I have not actually kept careful count, but what looks to be over 20 distinct items, maybe 30 distinct items, that's hours and hours and hours of staff time. And given that last year, the cost estimates that went into those budget docs was incredibly taxing on city staff during their busiest time of year, preparing for the June message in a new fiscal year. Staff's request, which I support and put in the message, is that we limit each of our offices here to five cost estimates, which is when you make a request to the city manager's budget office, and Jim Shannon's our director here in the box, to go do the exact costing of a proposed program, service, whatever it might be. Now, what's the difference? Well, for many of your budget docs, you will want a cost estimate because it's a city service or program that's going to require staffing. Yeah. However, uh -huh. you may have other budget docs that do not require city staffing. You might want to give $5,000 to the local PTA to do something. You might want to give a scholarship for something. You might want to do some sort of direct transfer, which could be appropriate for a budget doc sent to my office, but would not require cities, the city manager's budget office to go do a detailed cost estimate. Gotcha. No, I understand the BD process, but I was ask, asking more specifically that if, you know, at the end of your doc, it says all budget documents that recommend the city provided service. So if we want to do... An example: Viva Parks at a at, at a at a yeah. at a park in in my district. 
I would need a, one of those five cost estimates. You would need a cost estimate from Jim Shannon and his team. All right, well, well what if um, it's you know, from, the, from a, a, the Parks and Recreation Department that's not an official cost estimate document? Since they're pretty cut and dry, they're, they've done, been done for numerous years, would that suffice as, and, and still have five other budget documents, uh, estimates, uh, or cost estimates in place. Does that make sense? I just think five is such an arbitrary number, and for many of us who are new, we may have already more than five cost estimate requests. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm going to submit 22 or, you know, some, some well, last ridiculous year, Last year we got 180, I believe. Right, right, right. But what and I'm saying nearly, is, you know, nearly, five is just a, an yeah. arbitrary number that, you know, I'd like a little bit well, more, yeah. well, you know, a little bit yeah. more fluidity on. And I understand staff's uh, the, the pressure we're putting on staff, and I'm cognizant of that, but, you know, yeah. if it's seven, eight, you know, nine, it, is it a hard cut off at five? Currently, yes, but let's hear from the administration. Yeah, I just, I'm just, let me weigh in here. You know, uh, for years when we started this cost estimate process, and the reason we started it, it was because council members would be submitting BDs to the mayor's office, and they were not close to being correct on the cost to be able to be implemented. So we started this process out to give you a better tool of what it would really cost when you're ultimately approving the budget if the budget document is included in the, in the June budget message and ultimately approved by council. The reason that we did five you know, times 10 people is 50. That's about the number we used to get. We've been getting well over 100, and so we wanted to keep it around the 50 because staff's already working seven days a week and many times 18 hours a day from about now, and you've already been putting it in for the, forec for the forecast document, all the way up until budget adoption, and it has thrown staff, to be frank, over the edge. And we've actually had people, I hate to say this because uh, I don't like to be dramatic, but we actually have had a staff quit over this process because it was so intense and so time consuming and they're, they're trying to prov uh, provide MBAs on questions, prepare for the budget study sessions, and all staff throughout the organization has done that. So we're trying to put some parameters around it that we think is reasonable. However, I will say with the MBAs that have already been asked for, that is a lot of cost estimates we're already gonna be providing you to give you proxies for a lot of other things. Um, so that, that's why we, try, we wanted to suggest a process this year that would be hopefully helpful to the council members, given that there is a finite amount of money that the BDs usually come out of, which is that, that essential services reserve, although we will help you in finding other funding sources um, so that money can be stretched as, as much as possible because we know that we have a service shortage to our community. Um, but that's kind of the genesis of why uh, we uh, are being bold and proposing this this year because it's just been frankly a nightmare the last several years and trying to get that all done within this very short window um, of time frame but it's completely up to the the council to you know give us the direction that you want to give us but we wanted to to propose something we thought was reasonable and and again you all get a, you will get a lot of cost estimates because you're giving you know we've got information now that that you've asked for with all of these um uh, the, the substitute motion, we will be giving you even more um, that could be used for any council member uh, throughout this process. So that's just what the, the rationale was. I just want you to be Perfect. aware. Thank you, thank you, um, City Manager. I, 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 I appreciate that. And, and I, 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 my follow-up question would be, so if we get uh, a department giving us an estimate that's not an official cost estimate, would that suffice for the administration? Or does it have to be an official cost estimate through the, the, the budget office? It has to be officially through the budget office because okay. uh, that is the check and balance for this organization okay. because they have all the latest costs of everything. And so they work, We the budget office works with all the departments to develop it, but sometimes we can, the budget office might also find an alternative way to make it maybe a little cheaper, again, to have, in the spirit of getting as many things funded as possible. So there is a check and balance, and we do have the budget director sign off on those cost estimates. Great. So long as it's less than five requests. And so my, my, five, my concern. Five or not less than five or five, at least up to five. Yeah. I, my my <laughs> concern is, you know, as it, it'll, you know, as a first time, uh, you know, first year council member, it, it, I fear it, it, li it limits and hinders and or my, my ability to, to advocate for my residents uh, if I'm just you know, stuck at five cost estimates for, for potential budget document requests. And, then, and I understand the, the administration's cons concerns, but you know, the residents also have you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of asks, and, 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 and it's a fine balance, and, 
and th that's all I'm, all I'm asking for. And, and totally understand that and respect that. It's just, and we're hoping that we will address, even with this very, very tight budget, with all of the information that we've received from all of the council today, that we will address um, the best we can the needs that have been presented today through, this, through the main budget. So, um, but we know that there's many, many other, I call it, we have a service shortfall. Um, and there's many, many services that we need to continue to fund. So um, we can certainly talk offline too uh, more about this if you'd like, but um, I understand the dilemma, but that is our uh, proposal that we put in the city manager's budget request. Yeah, and I, and I support that proposal and that's why I put in the message, though I, I, understand, I understand the very real pressure council members face. And, um, and once again, I, I would just highlight that a number of budget documents can absolutely be smaller targeted grants to community-based organizations doing the work. And I think that's something we can certainly evaluate and, and is appropriate for a budget aspect. But I, I think the fundamental, and this is kind of the undercurrent of the entire message, the fundamental challenge we face as a city is that we have significantly lower revenue per capita because we have significantly fewer jobs per capita than other cities, and therefore we are very thinly staffed. We always say we're the most thinly staffed city hall in America. Well, it's true. We've said it so much that I think we've forgotten what it actually means in practice. And the single best way that we can retain staff, prevent staff from burning out, maintain good morale, and deliver high-quality services to our community is to empower staff by focusing on fewer bigger, more important things and freeing them up to focus on execution. And I just worry between the 20 to 30 new things that we've now added for additional research, plus what I'm sure will be 50 cost estimates, uh, we're, we're at risk of going right back to, uh, we've been in the position many times of passing recommendations and, and committing ourselves to things that we can't even implement. I just I want to emphasize that we, we have got to stop stretching ourselves too thin to actually deliver on our promises. But I, but I get the pressure. It's real, um, and it's a tough trade-off. So, okay, let's keep going. Was, sorry, Council Member, did you have anything else? Or were you, was your hand still up? No, I, I just wanted the rationale of, uh, of this, considering, um, you know, the, even, even in your, your budget message, you recommended Council submit BDs um, as part yeah. of it, so. Yeah. Yeah, and typically I think what I've seen in recent years is that we've, the mayors, the past mayor typically incorporated about five, five or so per, uh, per council office into the June message. That was about where we ended up, but sometimes we'd have an office ask for 15 estimates. And so hopefully folks really think hard about prioritization here, because I think that's, that's the situation we're in. Okay, uh, but appreciate the point, and Councilor Ortiz. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the, uh, to the administration for clarification. I, just, I guess I just want to clarify more, uh, more deeply because I, I do have a district, I'm representing a district that has a lot of needs. I'm having several organizations, neighborhood associations, nonprofits who are already reaching out, out to me, whether it's for like sponsoring scholarships, uh, you know, the Hispanic Foundation Ball, you know, all these big events. Does that mean that I can only do five things and I can't? None of those require a cost estimate. Okay. A All cost right. estimate, and, and Jim or Jennifer may want to chime in here, but I, I'll just tell you from experience, when we've requested even something as a Viva Calle or a, um, or a, or a park activation type program, it initially seems very straightforward. It's like, oh, this will be really simple. I need a couple staff, it'll take a couple hours, we'll do it for $10,000, and then we realize, oh, we actually need some security, oh, we need some cleanup, and then, oh, we need traffic control, and suddenly things that you just never anticipated start getting layered in, and it balloons, and now it's a significant amount of staff time and cost, and it's just, without having it go through a process, we could get ourselves in trouble saying that we are committing to things in the budget and that we can't actually deliver on. And then we're in even greater risk of, of eroding trust in government. But for a grant or a sponsorship or a scholarship or those kinds of things where you're partnering with a community-based organization uh, and, they, and, and they know how to deliver that service, that does not require a cost estimate because you're giving them the lump sum grant and it's up to them to deliver. Yeah, so what, just to add on, so in, in that case, our thought process is you can submit as many BDs as you want to uh, for those type of things. We're just talking about the city provides services just to give that, that distinction there um, because, again, uh, you, 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 you make that decision of what you would want to grant out. You don't need our help with that. It's totally on, on your 
and your decision. All right, and, and so is this going to, once we accept this, this is going to be the end? We can't bring this up again? Well, the, the process kicks off fairly soon, about a month from now. The, I forget now the exact date. I know it's in the it's in the message. Correct. Yeah. So Hold I think we, the message talks about a, a so submittal the, date starting on yeah. April twenty fourth. Looks like. Yeah. Yeah. So it's almost exactly a month. There it is. Yeah. Okay. And, to, and to the the issue is is that we well what we did this year was because also some feedback I received from council members last year is they wanted a little bit more time to think about what cost estimates they wanted and be able to submit them a little bit earlier. So we, we have them uh, being, beginning to begin to be submitted on April 24th, and then the deadline to submit them to the manager's office is May 10th, and, this, and then we will turn them around to you by May 19th. So we have basically nine days, calendar days, not working days, but we will be working anyway to get them back to you. Then you can decide, do I wanna submit that into a, a budget document or not? most often they get submitted into budget documents. Um, so that's what that time frame um, looks like. But just to be clear, what's happening between April 24th and you know that May 10th is they're producing the proposed budget with a thousand page document, the producing the capital budget and CIP, the thousand page document. Um, we want you to have the benefit of what's in the budget so you can see what gaps there may be. So we'll be, uh, again, like we've done in the last many, many years, um, we will brief you on the major proposals that are in the proposed budget so you can start getting a sense early, even before it's published, where, where we're going with how we're balancing the budget so you can uh, decide, gosh, I really feel like there's a gap there for my community or what have you. Um, we'll have those conversations before we actually produce the budget, so there'll be opportunities there. And then um, we will be also doing, spending that time frame in the beginning of May to uh, do a fees and charges document. This one is it's a lot. Um, and then we'll be preparing for all the budget study sessions and also during that time preparing all the manager budget addendums and often those can be 50 or 60 written reports for you as well so that's to give you that context of what's happening during that time so that's why this process calls for a manager's budget request which is those budget principles mm -hmm. uh, at high level of how you, you know to direct us of how to prepare the budget along with the specifics that are that are being discussed today through the mayor's march budget message and the amendments that are being discussed and then um, we're going uh, going from there. So that's why we're uh, we've submitted it as a something for consideration for the council. Okay. No, I definitely understand the need to prioritize. You know, this is my first budget process, so I guess I'm just hesitant to being put into a little box. I don't know what's going to happen throughout this process. Who's going to reach out to me for something that's probably important? Um, but I just hope that uh, there's consideration in regards to needs of, of districts. Thank yeah, you. and we will we will work with you um, to make sure of that. Okay, great. Thanks, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Jimenez. Yeah, I was just wondering, the City Manager can can remind us and me how, for example, I suspect several of us are going to be asking for for cost estimates related to Viva Parks or something like that. Obviously, in my mind, a lot of those are similar. And so, how, how does the budget office, or maybe it's the gym, how, how, does, how is that approached? Those boiler yeah, I'll let, type I'll let Jim take that one. Sorry, Council Member, I was not focusing so, in so, on you. So, I should so have for been. example, the, I, I assume there's likely going to be the case that a few of us are going to ask for Viva Park events, right? We want a budget estimate. So if District 8 Council Member submits that, right, and you give them that estimate, then I submit something. Uh, is it safe to say you're just it's going to be a cut and paste like okay you know we we just gave this the district date here's the information or how do you all approach that um i you know i think to the extent some of the stuff is pretty cut and paste and you know and to be clear departments you know bust their their butt to turn those around um right. so i think uh, and it's hard, it's hard to say until you actually have the request in front of you. Um, I think there is some standardization for how they can apply what those costs are, um, but there's often nuances in what actually the request is. Um, so I think it, it does vary a little bit, probably also depending on the type of park. Um, I, I think there is some level of variation. It's probably a mix of both. Okay. All right. I, I just think it'd be great to have some sort of standardization, if you will, because some of the requests are you're going to see a lot of those and to, so i hope that the departments will think that through a little bit to too so we don't have to duplicate efforts Correct. i think that's and your that's, point right that's the reason I yeah so yeah we'll think that through a little bit more because again i the whole 
point is that balance of trying to get through the budget process, but also give the council what it needs to do their job. And so I don't want to take away from that, but we're trying to balance both. But yeah. we'll think about that, how we can be helpful in that regard. Yeah, okay, all right, thank you. Great, appreciate that question. Okay, those were all the hands. Thank you all for all of your great thoughts, all the, the uh, detailed memos, great motion, council member. I think we are ready to vote. All right, that passes unanimously. Thank you all, and thank you again to staff for the incredible work that went into getting us to this point. Look forward to our budget study sessions and the rest of the process. Okay, we are on to item 3.6, COVID-19 after action report, and I believe there's a short presentation. Good evening, Mayor and Council, Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager. Um, I, along with Lee Wilcox and Dolan Beckel, had the privilege of serving as the Emergency Operations Center Director for over a year and a half, guiding our city's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging the tremendous work of the city staff and the team throughout that period of time and actually want to begin uh, with the hardest part by acknowledging all of those people that we lost um, over the last three years to, to COVID-19. And just a moment of silence for them and their family members and friends who miss them every day. One of our guiding principles in the Emergency Operations Center is to be open, candid, and direct in our communications, in giving feedback, and in receiving feedback. And as part of that practice, we have the practice of an after-action report, which typically is done after the action. Uh, in the case of COVID, Lee and I made the decision to do the initial active after action report while we were in the middle of the pandemic so that we could get the feedback and adjust our course while we were responding and while the teams were still in the field doing the work. So we employed constant associates to do that after action review. Um, and today what you will hear is the second after action report that takes us through the last phase of the pandemic where they are making open candid direct recommendations for what we did well what didn't work so well, and how we will improve in the future. And with that, I will turn it over to Ray and Susie to walk us through the contents of this. And then at the end, uh, we'll be here for any questions and feedback that you might have. So um, we'll start with the after action report overview and the content, and I'll move it over to Susie, uh, who I'll introduce in a minute. I'm Ray Reardon, the Director of the Office of Emergency Management. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and members in the audience. The purpose of the after action report, as indicated by Kip, was to, is to memorialize the efforts, the projects, the, the work that was accomplished, the successes, the challenges, and come up with uh, recommendations for future improvement. This helps us meet federal requirements when it comes to grant applications, as well as state applications for funding. Uh, they like to see this after action reports to understand what we accomplished, what we didn't, and what we plan to do in the future. It also helps us uh, improve our response to future emergencies, whether they're like exactly that emergency or similar in other ways. Uh, for example, we have food operations, which we do expect to have after an earthquake too. So there's some similarities between those types of events. This after action report then there we go. 
Um, this after action folks, this particular report, as Kip indicated, we had two reports. So this report focuses on November 20th to February 22nd. We do recognize that we continued, uh, 2022, <laughs> um, we do recognize that we continue to do work, additional work, into uh, as late as uh, November of 2022 with things like vaccination and other programs. So it just didn't terminate in February, we're picking a point in time when things had improved. So this um, plan does take a look at uh, what we did cover first in the first report. It references some recommendations that were similar just to continue doing those operations or updates. Uh, and our pandemic response plan, which actually started in January 24 prior to uh, the response to the pandemic going on because we saw it coming and we had to prepare. And lastly, we did, uh, the council did approve uh, the first round or did accept the first report on May 4th of 2021. Uh, so this is a follow-up to that. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Susie. Susie Schmitz is from Constant Associates. She was a lead provider in the review. Uh, there was a whole team of staff that assisted. Uh, many workshops and many projects were pulled together to evaluate the response. Thank you, Ray, and good evening, Council and Mayor and everyone else who is attending and listening from home. Um, I have the privilege to be able to tell you a little bit about the content that goes into this after action report. So what I'll be doing today is just going through a few slides that briefly highlight some of the key findings. The findings that we include within this after action re report include strengths, notable areas for improvement and recommendations. So those will be the ones that I go through, and I'll start with the notable strengths. So the first example that I'd like to provide is the fact that the uh, city of San Jose shifted city council sessions to virtual, which enabled the continuity of government and departmental, programmatic, and developmental projects were able to continue to move forward in spite of the pandemic. The next notable strength is that the most critical information that was provided by the city was translated into multiple languages for the public, which prioritized health equity. The city also successfully communicated emergency food services to the public and distributed food to its residents with nearly 8 million meals provided in October 2020 alone, and 5 million were distributed between 2021 and 2022. Oops, excuse me. Let me go back to strength number four, if it will listen to me. There we go. San Jose Vaccine Task Force supported the county public health in efforts and su successfully helped reach residents with vaccination information, which resulted in an 85% of residents having at least one dose of the vaccine by July of 2021, which made San Jose the first of the 10 largest U.S. cities in America to hit that percentage. And the final strength that I would like to highlight is that the city housing and homeless response team strengthens its relationship during one of the most difficult periods in a disaster response in decades with the county and adapted the shelter programs to be able to meet residents' needs, including the creation of a hotline that streamlined the process of people being able to find available shelters and medical respite. The next things that I would like to go over, as I mentioned, we have the strengths, we have areas for improvement, and we have recommendations. One of the best ways to be able to consolidate recommendations is to put it into what we call an improvement plan, which is a complementary document to the after action report. In that improvement plan, we list both the areas for improvement and the recommendations. The purpose of the improvement plan is to provide a consolidated list of these recommendations that were identified and listed within the report to be able to enable the city to use them for quality improvement efforts and take action to, the, to address the recommendations in order to be able to prepare for future disasters and build on innovations and avoid repeating the same mistakes. So the first area for improvement and then the recommendation that I would like to highlight is that we found during our data collection that there was a reported limited training for emergency operations staff, 
which could be addressed by expanding uh, emergency management courses in the multi-year training and exercise plan. I'd like to point out that this plan has already been approved in December 2022, and this recommendation is currently underway of being addressed. We also found within, it was also reported to us that there was conflicting job expectations of staff in the Emergency Operations Center as they were tasked to fill both their response role as well as their daily responsibilities and duties in other departments. The city's continuity plan could include identifying personnel needed to be able to maintain essential functions, as well as identify the number of individuals that would be needed during a disaster response in order to differen differentiate those roles and move away from having dual responsibilities. And as of December 2022, the city's continuity plan has already started to be updated with these types of information. Our data also showed that the library system was tasked with reopening while staff were unavailable, as many of them were responding to the emergency operations center. And working, so what we've recommended is that working with city departments to increase the number of people who could respond to the emergency operations center could help increase the labor pool available for emergency response roles and mitigate this particular uh, issue in the future. We also heard that numerous factors contributed to stress and burnout in city staff. Working with the Human, Re Human Resources Department in the Office of Employee Relations to create guidance and approaches to address stress can help support employees' mental wellness. Staff also reported lacking resources to adequately support people with disabilities and individuals with access and functional needs during this disaster. With departments and partner organizations assessing and identifying how to improve this, there will be opportunities to really look at unique, uh, unique challenges and ways to um, improve this here within San Jose. <clears throat> I would like to point out that the city has already started to take some of these actions. Yeah. In particular, the, the city has hired a disability. Acciones and oh, um, the city has hired a disability okay. affairs officer uh, who is scheduled to work with a contractor to train all city staff on Americans with Disabilities compliance. And last but certainly not least, uh, the last example we'd like to provide is that we found that shifting out of the disaster response roles and back to day-to-day -to -day duties made it difficult for staff to add recovery uh, acti activities to their responsibilities as well. And that therefore meant that less trained staff were expected to pull, be pulled in to support these recovery programs. So the recommendation was to explore necessary training or possibly just-in-time training for staff who would be involved in recovery roles. Um, this could include things like behavioral health training as well as trauma-informed care. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Susie. Um, the next steps are uh, to accept the, the 2023 COVID-19 After Action Report uh, by the Council, and then ongoing updates will be, provide, be provided by the Office of Emergency Management when we do our annual reports in August to the PISFIS Committee. And as we close, it's useful to remember the last two principles that we have in the Emergency Operations Center. The, the very first one, of course, was be compassion in action. This snapshot from August 2021 is a reminder of all of the new services and activities that the Emergency Operations Center and the team spun up to respond to the pandemic, including the feeding that we've talked about, the uh, education and child care safe spaces, the digital inclusion with the 15,000 hotspots, the vaccination, including would remind you hiring 200 folks to work with Santa Clara County in addition to our own uh, targeted vaccination efforts, which eventually reached over 50,000 people, as well as reaching many, many small businesses, the ongoing communication in four plus languages and our housing and homelessness work. And then the final principle uh, is really to be one team. 
And so we conclude with a thank you to the team, the up to 750 individuals who are part of the Emergency Operations Center, the 5,000 plus individuals in the city who continue to provide essential services um, while all of us were pivoting to the pandemic response, and the hundreds and hundreds of community partners and neighborhood organizations and community organizations that came out and saw us through this hardest of times. Um, really, really one of the privileges of command is to tell the story of others. And everything that we did was the team. So big appreciation to them. What we'll do is we'll take this, we will learn from it, we will improve, and we'll build this into it, our work, so we are ready the next time anything comes. So with that, we close, and we are open to any questions, feedback, and direction that you might provide. Great. Thank you for the after action report. And I'll just echo that thanks. As I mentioned in the March budget message that was our previous item, I, I think our pandemic response was truly one of our city's finest moments to see the hundreds and hundreds of staff who pivoted from what their job description was to what it needed to be to address that immediate and urgent need was just inspiring to see and truly saved lives. So I'm incredibly proud of our staff for the work they did and uh, appreciate this thoughtful report on how we can even further improve our ability to respond in the future. Why don't we see if we have any public comment? Blair followed by Paul. Hi, again, I hope my uh, Zoom is not going out. Sorry. Uh, just to thanks a lot for this item on the uh, previous city budget item person commenting on uh, cert work, pay their work. Good luck with that. I've tried hard the past few years to really ask the question, what do we have, do we have to prepare for something even more drastic in the next few years than we can say? Earthquake-wise, I think we're all asking that question. Uh, I think I've been trying to answer that. I, it doesn't seem like it may be happening, but we have to be clear with each other. We have to be really open and honest with each other at this time. This is the time to really be open. Because I think in the next year, it will be crunch time to be worrying about. It. Preparing for it, but not trying to cause harm in our practices anymore. Let's see if we can be open to describe this sort of thing. Paul, followed by Brian. Uh, yes, uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge all the lives of my elders that were lost due to the living conditions and due to the fact that it was the Latino labor that continued to keep the backbone of this city straight during one of the most treacherous times in our history. That's number one. Number two, there's a precedent for that. The backbone of San Jose's economy is agriculture. Who were the ones picking the fruit? My community, once again. San Jose would have folded. L let, me, let me ask you to think about something, just real quick. What would have happened had there been no Latinos working in the construction, in the food industry, packing the, uh, packing the, uh, the trucks, unloading the trucks? Brian? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I'd agree with what the other two speakers said, and we do need to thank the Latino community and a lot of other communities who, um, you know, the store workers, firemen, the police, the people who uh, work in the agricultural industry. But in my case, the people who work at 7-Eleven, because that's what made me survive the pandemic, because <laughs> I don't cook very well. But anyways, it... it I hope we learned something from it. It was sad that at the federal level it, it was handled like a you know WWE wrestling match. But all right, thank you. And I I just think just a second to think about all the people who lost their lives during that thing. And and, and God be with all of the families. Thank you. Back to the council. Great, thank you, Tony. Okay. Let's go to council discussion. Councilman Ortiz. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I also want to share uh, my uh, gratitude to staff uh, who 
really um, worked fast in order to provide support resources to some of our most vulnerable uh, communities, whether it be um, residents, renters, you know, members of our houseless population. Um, I, I thank you for the work and all the staff of the city of San Jose for, for their work and dedication, risking uh, your own lives to infection during that um, tumultuous time. So thank you. Um, I do have uh, specific questions in regards to the small business outreach because obviously I've been an advocate for small business for a long time. I saw that there was um, a survey that was done to small businesses and there was unfortunately only one response from a Latino business owner, zero responses from a Vietnamese business owner and only two responses from a Chinese business owner. I know that you all, the, the, the city was translating communication, so I just wanted to see what the staff thoughts are in regards to, um, I guess, the, the lack of participation in that survey. Oh, thank you, Blage. Sure, good evening, Councilmember Ortiz, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, Blage is a Deputy Director for Business Development. Um, so the survey sample size was actually a pretty small survey sample size, if you're referring to this, the survey in the appendix. Mm -hmm. So I think there were about 165, 66 respondents. Um, and quite honestly, I think that there's probably a couple of different reasons for that. We were actually, I mean, we, we changed our entire focus during the COVID pandemic from the small business or the business development team change its focus to obviously helping small business. So we were actually doing a lot of communication in multiple languages with the business community on a regular basis. We had twice weekly webinars. We had, um, we had business and technical assistance uh, providers reaching out to, to folks. And so I think that there was some, uh, a little bit of fatigue, quite honestly, by the time we got to the end. Uh, with folks responding to us. I can tell you that we did have very good um, responses for our webinar attendees, um, and, and we did have um, good response in our kind of back and forth communication from folks that had access to PPP. So if you look at the PPP numbers for San Jose, if you look at the, the grant applications, we were pretty successful. One of the things that we did learn, though, from the pandemic was that the areas of the city that had the biggest response from businesses were the areas where we had a very strong kind of business organization or partner. And that is really what has formulated our work plan moving forward uh, in the sense that um, we were lucky enough to get a number of allocations um, uh, through the ARPA funding for small business uh, organizational capacity building and business technical assistance. And we were also able to get some funding for supplemental business communications, which basically now everything that we're doing in OEDCA, we're doing in three languages. Um, so while I think we were also disappointed in the number of responses that we received, mm -hmm. um, that, that told us a lot and has really helped us to formulate our plan uh, moving forward where we are much more intentional um, in a variety of different ways about reaching out to the non-English speaking community uh, in our city. Thank, thank you so much, uh, uh, Blage. Um, and I'm glad to hear that the city is moving uh, towards a direction. I know that you're working, of course, with the Latino Business Foundation, Prosperity Labs, who I know were at the forefront during that pandemic. Um, is there any outreach right now specifically intentionally for like Vietnamese businesses? Absolutely. So some of the work that we're doing um, is actually along Tully Road in the formation of a right. um, Tully Road business organization, Neighborhood Business Association. Uh, we are also uh, specifically our two of the positions that were funded through ARPA in, in OED business development. One was Vietnamese speaking, the other was Spanish speaking. We hadn't had that before. Um, and the uh, so that has actually allowed us to make pretty significant inroads into the Vietnamese business community that we hadn't before. The other thing that we are doing uh, that came out of COVID on a much regular basis uh, is the biz walks in a variety of different uh, commercial business districts in the city. And actually just last week, we were out on Aborn Road. Um, and so I think oh. we're doing much better <laughs> now in making those inroads to the communities that we just didn't really have the resources previously. Yeah, yeah, and it's 
sorry to had to we had to go through a pandemic to get mo more focused, but I'm glad that I guess that this is one thing that we did learn because a lot of our, especially our immigrant businesses, they're not gonna walk through the door at City Hall. A lot of them don't know about that type of stuff. So I guess that goes to my next question. How, did, how were these uh, surveys sent out? How were they sent out to the businesses? I, they were sent out in a variety of different ways. I know that we did do, um, we did send out the survey to our mailing list, kind of the SJ Economy mailing list, but quite honestly, we are not able to parse that mailing list out where you could um, parse it out to a small business versus let's say uh, a corporate partner. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the things that we are working on um, also with ARPA funding is really being able to fine tune who our distribution is going to and really be able to target communications to the small business owner mm -hmm. uh, when we've got programs and initiatives that we wanna communicate with them about and then our corporate and larger business partners when we have you know, incentives or other programs that we want to communicate to them about. So another kind of silver lining lesson learned out of the pandemic uh, was that we really needed to hone in on our messaging to kind of those two very important parts of our business community. Yeah, no, I 100% I, I agree. I don't, I'm not sure how many small businesses on Allen Rock Avenue or Story Road are subscribed to the, uh, uh, the department's uh, email, but... Um, that's why uh, I definitely advocate for boots on the ground, people going out there. You know, it's almost like community organizing. It's big business advocacy. But I'm very proud of the direction the city is making. Some of the people who I think have been trying to meet with the city regarding small businesses are now being invited to the table. And I just really want to thank you all for that leadership. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Foley. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. And Kip, thank you for starting with centering us on what this was all about and the loss of so many lives that uh, we lost during that, that time. It was a little over three years ago that we uh, went into lockdown. And I think those of us who were on council and those who were, we have some uh, school board members who were very much impacted by those days and in the work that that they were doing and you know I still remember it very well and I probably um, am traumatized still to this day ov over it so I appreciate the compassion and action and I it, it's just tremendous to me in in reflecting on the report on how much work the city did with such a small staff to so quickly pivot to deliver the meals that we were primarily responsible for in the early days, and then the vaccinations and everything else that, that went into the duties. But in, in this report, it's really important to see and be aware that we had staff doing double duties and how unfair that was to them because they still had the concerns of being at home and taking care of their kids and maybe they had kids in school who were doing virtual education and how hard that was, or they had parents maybe in care homes that they couldn't see. There was so much going on that the efforts of our staff is must be acknowledged and, uh, and celebrated, really, the efforts that they put into it because it truly, they sacrificed so much to do their jobs, both their regular day jobs and then the pandemic, the, the emergency operations center jobs. So I just, I just wanna say thank you for the work of the EOC and all that you and your team did to get us through those times. And it was traumatizing for all of us. It was very difficult for all of us, but you were more on the, uh, on the ground floor really addressing it in, an, in every day. Um, I also want to ask, because Thursday we have a special meeting on the Emergency Operations Center, and I'm, I'm going to reflect that the last time we did this was shortly before a pandemic occurred. So I'm hoping that nothing like that happens again, that we don't have an earthquake or something else in the next day. But if we do, we'll be prepared, right? And, and so how do you feel going into the, the meeting, the special session on Thursday, 
Are we prepared? Are we going to come out of it ready to go when the next thing happens? Yes. Yes, we are 10 times more prepared than we were in 2017. And we are now in the enviable position of having a strong and capable team. The trick is that this is like muscles, right? If you don't exercise them, they atrophy. So we have to maintain this capacity and we have to make sure that the next generation of leaders who are a bit smarter and a bit more diverse and bring a lot of great experience are given the opportunity to strengthen their skills and their leadership skills so that when that quake happens and somebody who doesn't have as much gray hair walks into that EOC to take the director's role, that she is prepared to lead the city. And so that is, that is the task that I'm most concerned about now is making sure we create the space and opportunity for the brilliant uh, emerging leaders in our team to be trained and prepared for what comes next. But we as a team, we are prepared for whatever will come and we will stand ready uh, to respond. Uh, that's wonderful. I really have no doubt that you are prepared and that we will stand behind you and support you in any any way that we can. I just want to say thank you with all my gratitude and all my heart to you and all of your staffs for everything that you did to get us through the pandemic. And while I know it's not, we still have phases of it, people are still getting COVID, it's not how it was in the early days. And the before times aren't going, we're not going back to the before times. But we've learned a lot, and I believe that our staff is so resilient and strong, but we do need to pay attention to their mental health and give them the space to, um, to be okay with some of the things they're going through. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Batra? I think um, I endorse all the stuff which my colleague council member Pam Foley has said, and I personally can see that <clears throat> the numbers which you presented, like the food distribution, they do tell one dimension of the problem which you faced and how nicely you handle. The other dimension you were facing in this particular case was the, all the people who were supposed to be helpful, they themselves were going through some special challenges because their families were going through some catching COVID. They had to be now quarantined and then they cannot come and help even though they may be wanting to. So the challenges of that uniqueness of people having to be quarantined, families having to be quarantined, and then the logistics of managing that level of distribution when your people who are supposed to help themselves are actually needing help. So recognizing that behind the scene activity, which must have been a logistical nightmare, you guys handled it beautifully. The vaccination rates are very impressive that uh, I myself received so many communications on it. I found out where the vaccination centers were, how to get the appointment on that one, while my own medical provider Kaiser wasn't able to get the vaccine for people of certain age brackets and all that, but from the city, we were able to get that happen. And I got my vaccination from the city before I was eligible to get it from Kaiser. So, so those are all behind the scene activities which do speak in the numbers, but I think it's admirable that how the city staff with all those challenges performed as well as we did. I have one question about uh, you say that you met the federal requirement in sending the report or something. Do you, there was some comment about that this met the federal requirement for the report or AARP or something? Correct. When we have um, applications for grants and things of that nature, they want to know, do we do after action reports after emergency? So this fills that requirement if it's asked. Uh, when we do the applications. I see. So that's just a checkbox that Correct. you did submit. There's no comment, no feedback, nothing on that one. It's a checkbox that's Correct. done. Okay, very good. Congratulations on all the work you did, even though it was a very hard work and some sad work because we lost so many people. And But uh, congratulations on having done it well uh, as 
as tough a work it was. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Torres? Yeah, uh, Kip, thank you uh, so much for, for that presentation. Uh, so for, for a city employee like myself that's been off and on for uh, 20 years, for many of us, it's always been important to step it up for, for our community. And so COVID-19, our city employees did that. And it, it didn't matter if you were a rec leader, it didn't matter if you were a librarian, it didn't matter, matter if you were a public works uh, specialist or an analyst. Our city employees went to vaccination sites, food, food uh, locations, schools, you name it. They stepped it up. And it's, it's very important that we say thank you to them. Uh, I, I was still working for then Council Member Carrasco, so you know, for me, being at testing locations and vaccine, vaccine sites and giving, giving away food, yes, it was very, very scary because at that time I also lived in a house full of other people uh, who, had to, who could stay home and I couldn't. Uh, but I, you know, just like myself and just like other city employees, we knew that we had to make sure that our community was healthy and our community was safe. And our city employees did that for two years, now going on three years, unfortunately. Uh, and it's, it's very sad, it's very sad that we, that we did lose uh, a lot of our San Jose residents, that we did lose a lot of our small businesses, particularly our, our, our small businesses who are immigrant uh, based. Um, and so um, I just hope that <laughs> we don't have another pandemic or another emergency. I know that Council Member Foley just mentioned uh, an earthquake. I don't like those. I don't think any of us do. I remember 1989 uh, vividly. Uh, so um, I, I just want to give our, our city, city leadership from the, from the top all the way down to, um, to the bottom a, a big kudos and, and thank you so much for all your service. Thanks, Councilmember. Councilmember Dawn. Well, I have to say, my hands is, is uh, bow down to you guys for the extreme good work from, we've learned a lot from 2017 and then the pandemic from the vaccination site. We, we vaccinated 33,000 government employees right out of the fairground. And that's including you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousand citizen. We provided food for our citizen, for the unhoused residents. We created housing, we did some prevention, we transport. And I say that the staff, we, we did more for less in a sense. And I was part of it and I, I feel that we need to continue with that recruitment and retention so our employees don't get burned out, they can spend time with their family and do what they normally would like to do. And I know that all of us up here are committed to support all of you by finding different solution in finance, in resource, in tools, from technologies to whatever it is that's takes to, to make our city better. And I just wanna say thank you very much. Great, thank you, council member. Vice Mayor. Thank you. I too wanna to echo my thanks to you and the staff for all the work. You know, one of the things that occurred to me is that I know we saw this with our, our students where there's a lingering effect. Uh, and I was just curious as to whether or not we will continue to provide some help and assistance or in, in terms of health and wellness and, and that sort of thing. Because um, what we've seen with our, with our children is that uh, the mental health effects of what they went through, right? What the families went through. Um, you know, it is trauma, 
And so I was just curious in terms of is there is there something available? Um, should people choose to to you know uh, to use it um, in terms of health and wellness? Yes, there is. I don't see Kelly Parmalee here, but she's been instrumental as part of the human resources team in leading our efforts around this work in a couple of ways. One, of, of, of thinking about trauma-informed care yeah. and trauma-informed services and realizing that the community has been traumatized as well, and so how do we approach them with respect and grace, and how do we approach ourselves with respect and grace? Because uh, we may have been in a position a bit more privileged or less privileged, depending on where we were, but we've all gone through that trauma. So we continue to, to do work and in support of the employees. We, the employee assistance program remains available to our employees, and we encourage them. And we've been creating spaces for people to to process this and to and to see and understand how it applies back into their work and how how it applies back into their life but I I think you're correct it's one of these things and in my experience with the veterans in my family these types of experiences take a while to work through the the body and the and the, and the system and it it really will only be a few years or even decades from now that we realize how much this has affected us all so I think we need to be continually um, vigilant and open to supporting those who went through this, just as we need to care for those who are the veterans of, of war and conflict. Thank you. Great, thank you. Do we have a motion to accept the staff report? A motion to accept. Second. Councilor Dewan got the mic on. We'll get the second from Jimenez. Second. Great. Okay. We're ready to vote. I hear doors opening, so I'm going to leave it up for a little bit. Got one more. All right, that passes unanimously. Thanks, Tony. Thank you for the report. We are on to item 8.1, master pre-lease with PMI Partners, LLC. Do we have a staff report? I don't believe we do. Okay, hopefully everybody read the memo. Memos. We have public comment. Paul Soto. This deal stinks because it has the hallmarks of Gary Gillibo written all over it. He thinks that he's going to come in, throw his money around, and think that, okay, well, oh, well, he's helping build this uh, uh, Pacific Motor in. You know, while he's decimating our city, do you know what genocide is? Genocide with manners is a budget proposal. That's what it is. That's genocide with manners, because that's what you're doing with our community. And Gary Gillibo thinks that he can soothe his conscience by aligning himself with the city to produce the financing to build this? Uh-uh. He owes a lot more. And we're ready to collect, too. We're going to collect from him. Because he owes this city a lot more than just a Pacific Motor Inn. He owes this city an honest appraisal of what he is going to be doing to my community. And that is genocide with manners. Back to the council. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Councilor Torres. I would just um, move to support item 8.1 and um, my memo and the mayor's memo. Second. Second. Great. Second from Davis. Councilor Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I want to thank staff from the Housing Department uh, for working so hard on a very bold experiment in mixed income housing development for the city of San Jose. Uh, I truly believe this is um, an amazing project. And I hope this model proves successful to meet, both meet our uh, affordable and market rate housing construction goals and you know, dismantle the socioeconomic segregation that has defined so much of you know, any city's history here uh, in the United States. Um, one of the reasons that cities like Vienna and Helsinki are considered models of urban planning is the prevalence of mixed income developments. When you have sanitation workers living directly next to bank executives, you start to address much of the many social ills that plague us as opposed to when you concentrate poverty in a specific area. Um, whether it's racial segregation, poor educational outcomes, and systemic neglect, we can begin to 
uh, address these issues um, as we make neighborhoods more diverse uh, economically. Um, instead, what you're building right now is a stronger community with access to high quality city services for all. So I just wanna say that I support the memo by the mayor and by council member Torres and uh, I, I believe we need to enable staff to move fast and uh, make sure that we're proposing more innovative projects like this one. Thank you. Thanks, Councilmember. Appreciate those comments. Councilmember Dwan? I just got a quick question. Is there any impact to staff resources if they assist PATH in securing these tax credits? What do you mean by staff resources? And maybe we can have Rachel. I see Rachel's on her way down. Can you just clarify? Do you mean staff time or yes, city uh, dollars? Staff times and whatever else need to secure these tax credits. Thank you, Council Member. Rachel Vanderveen, um, Assistant Director of the Housing Department. And so as the, um, I think what you're referring to is one of the recommendations included in the memo um, from, count, from the Mayor and Council Member Torres. The support for um, applying for funds to the California Debt Limit Allocation Committee, SIDLAC, will be routine staff work that we do for, for um, every affordable housing development that comes through our doors that we want to move forward. So it would not add any additional demands on our team. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Batra. <clears throat> I think this project is uh, a good example of the type of projects communities will accept because like my, my colleague uh, mentioned that mixed use properties is probably much more acceptable to the community neighborhood uh, because if we build the affordable homes with 30 percent um, affordable income you get one kind of people and one kind of facilities, one kind of stuff. Neighborhood may not find it very acceptable. Plus, the rents collected are probably not enough to even operate the facilities properly. So having mixed use with higher income, lower income, and all that, it addresses both of them, that the people will find it more acceptable. And secondly, the rent collected probably would be enough to be able to meet the operating cost, and hence the operator will find it more easy to operate. So I think a mixed use should be our priority in building any of those, and this being an example of that, I'm totally supportive of it. Thanks, Council Member, and I very much agree with the comments that were made. I think uh, Council Member Ortiz really captured my feelings on this. I think the, um, the innovative approach here that's gonna get us real density and truly a mixed income project with a whole lot of units in an area that's amenity rich, reasonably well served by transit is just a really exciting possibility. So I appreciate all the extra work staff has done to make this possible and um, the support I'm hearing from the Council to move forward. I saw another hand go up. We'll go to Councilor Torres. No, I, I totally forgot to just thank uh, housing and other stakeholders who, who made this happen because I know that the first go around was not so, uh, not so kind to us and uh, we went back and did it the right way, so thank you. Great. Thanks for that addition. All right, let's see any other hands. Why don't we vote? Great, it passes unanimously, thank you, Tony. We are on to our final agendized item, which is item 8.2, calendar year 2022, San Jose Housing Element Annual Progress Report and fiscal year 2021-2022, Housing Successor to the Redevelopment Agency Annual Report, and we have a short presentation. I see staff's on their way down.
Good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council. My name is Ruth Gueto, and I'm a supervisor planner in PBCE. And with me is uh, Director Jackie morales Ferran from the Housing Department, Chris Burton, our director in PBCE, as well as Michael Brio, Deputy Director. I believe we have Kristen Clemens, Division Manager in the Housing Department on Zoom. Um, so this presentation will cover the 2022 Housing Element Annual Progress Report. This report covers the fifth cycle housing element, which runs from 2014 to 2023. The annual progress report is required by state law to provide an update on the city's progress toward meeting our regional housing need allocation. Once again, there are new reporting requirements, such as the number of SB9 lot split applications received and any new units constructed under that new law. We also have to report on home key project applications as well. This year's report also requires information on all applications received in 2022, not just those that go directly to the planning, depart planning division, um, but also ADU applications that are submitted directly to the building division. This table shows the city's fifth cycle RENA targets, which is um, Overall, 35,080 units over the course of an 8.8 year cycle, as well as our annual goal, goals on the very uh, right column. As you can see, almost 60% of our target is for households whose incomes are below 120% AMI. Uh, a few highlights. So um, as noted in the staff report, this is the final reporting year for the fifth cycle of the housing element. A new cycle began in January 2023 and it will run through January 2031. A few highlights. Um, the city has met only 62% of our total housing production goals. We met more than our fair share of market rate, but only achieved 26% of our affordable goals. Even with limited financial resources for affordable housing, San Jose did exceed local, regional, and statewide fifth cycle RENA averages. And we also completed 98% of the planning programs and policies in the fifth cycle. This table compares um, our, the 2022 housing permits issued, the dark blue bars, against our annual goal, the TEAL bars. Across all income categories, the number of building permits issued fell behind the, the annual target. This is our cumulative RENA performance. So looking across the 8.8 .8 year period, we find that we achieved our market rate production as noted in the 115% uh, number towards the right. The second best performing would be moderate income at 42%. However, none of these moderate income units are restricted affordable housing. They may have been in the affordable rent range at one time, but the rents can escalate with the market. And I'll hand it over to Jackie now. Thank you, Ruth. I'm Jackie Morales Friend, and I am the Director of Housing. Um, this final report of the housing element cycle shows clearly that while, sorry, I'm going back to the last slide, which I'm not having a problem doing. Well, that last slide <laughs> showed clearly that we were exceeding our market rate goal by 15%, but we fell far short from our affordable housing production meeting only 26% of the goal for ELI up to moderate income housing. If you do not count the non-restricted moderate income units, we only met 20% of the goal for ELI, VLI, and LI units together. And those are the units that we would be typically subsidizing through the housing department. This to me speaks to the urgent need for our support for affordable housing production in San Jose. Looking at our local housing markets from the most recent data available from 2022, up, oh, we went back and now I'm gonna go. Okay, good. Um, 
and looking at our current data, we can see that San Jose's rental market continues to strengthen overall with rents 5% higher this time over last year. What's interesting to note is that Class A rents for the most expensive apartments continue to have higher vacancy rates than the rest of the market, but are, con but are continuing to recover from highs during the pandemic. A lower vacancy rate for lower priced Class C housing illustrates the strong demand for affordable housing units in our expensive market. The for sale market has gone through some challenges with interest rates having risen by the end of last year. Median prices are down year over year by 12%. However, increased interest rates means that buyers struggling to afford high housing costs can qualify for even smaller mortgages, making homeownership far out of reach for the majority of San Jose's residents. The city saw an increase in units um, pulling building permits by 7%, and over half of the new homes were located in urban villages. And finally, ADUs continue to rise in popularity. Um, they were up by almost 7% year over year. Staff continue to work hard on the initiatives under the Housing Catalyst Work Plan. This work plan will be transitioned to incorporate work to do from the six cycle housing element, which is now in draft form and coming to the City Council in June. Last year, the Council approved a general plan amendment to make 100% affordable housing developments exempt from commercial space requirements per the recommendation of the general plan for your tax for task force. Staff advocated with Oakland and San Francisco on rules for the state bond allocation agency to remove some of the Bay Area's disadvantage on scoring due to more expensive building forms needed for our urban areas. And finally, the Housing Department staff issued NOFAs that awarded $242 million for development of 2,130 affordable homes, bringing forward those commitments gradually to council as developments get shovel ready. And in terms of our last updates, uh, staff continue to oversee the operation of the city's first home key site from the first round of state funding, using this to shelter our most vulnerable residents from COVID-19. Staff has been working towards closing acquisitions on the two home key sites that have already been awarded state funding of um, one you heard right before this item. And finally, staff began work with a consultant, HRNA, to develop a preservation loan product to start our focus on the third P of housing, which would enable our affordable housing developers to buy existing homes and turn them into affordable, uh, which would help lower income renters stay in their homes, creating more stability. The last part, um, the last report that's included in this is our report on the housing successor agency. And the, we are required to file this every year as an annual report and it is about the work of the former redevelopment agency for 2021-22. The report indicates that the city has land, loans, and cash from former redevelopment funds totaling $716 million. The city is in compliance with all of our requirements and met all of the four required tests. And with that, we are done with our presentation and are available for questions. Thank you. Great, thank you to staff for the report. Do we have any public comment? Yes, Paul Soto followed by Catalyze SV. <coughs> And I'm sorry, man, I couldn't stop laughing at that report. That was a joke. If you think that you can come up with some rhetoric that is going to excuse and make that okay, you are, you are practicing duplicity, a con on the, the constituents that are most impacted by those statistics. Let me repeat to you one of them. All market rate housing goals have been met. Only 25% of ALI, VLI, and LI have been met. That right there, I don't care how you cut it. That is a disgusting statistic that this city's conscience and moral authority is compromised. You're disgusting as a city. 
Catalyze SV followed by Blair. It's been a tough few years and staff has wor been working hard, but that 26% statistic really stands out. We've only built 26% of the affordable housing we need in our city. So next time council members, a developer comes into your district and says they wanna build four stories, I suggest you ask them if they could build five or six or seven. The next time a developer comes into your district and says, I'm gonna build 100% market rate housing and I'm gonna pay the fee, ask them to build the affordable housing on site as part of that project. The next time they say they're gonna build affordable housing at 100% of the AMI, which is now $117,000 in our county, ask them to go lower, to build deeper affordable housing for our neediest neighbors. You can solve this problem in the eight years ahead. Blair, followed by Jill. Hi, Blair here. Uh, uh, I was going to hear the importance of uh, that we're liking to some housing ideas a lot. Um, it's important you learn how to talk about how to couple those housing ideas with extremely low and very low income. When you bring those two concepts together, that's the sort of innovative feature in how we talk about the feature of concepts like market rate housing. Market rate housing is kind of an old fashioned term at this point. You have to be very more specific. And uh, the middle income and very, very low, extremely low income ideas are the real ways to develop our future practices that we have to be here to talk about. Really work on uh, real uh, affordable housing for, for people who really need it. Jill? Thank you. This is Jill Borders, District 10 resident. I just wanted to comment on the fact that in the housing element, I've never read anything about how the state uh, has asked any city to discuss plans for uh, ownership, housing ownership. So it's always about affordable housing, market rate, renting, you know, it's one or the other. And so basically we're we're a city, we're going to be a city of renters and sort of just this on, on either ends of the spectrum. And that's why mobile home communities to me have been so powerful and so impactful personally. Uh, it's had a psychological effect on me to own this place, to be responsible for the next $15,000 it's costing us to, you know, fix the side of the house, the electrical panel and the roof and so forth. Um, and along with that, the pride that comes with that. And I just really want to see ownership being discussed more as we go forward. Back to council. Great, thank you. Um, just want to offer a couple of thoughts and then I'll turn to my colleagues. Um, one, one thing I just, and I appreciate the, the report, one of the things I do, I've, I've mentioned before, but I just want to caution us on is this notion that we exceeded our market rate goal, and, and it, it is strictly true. But, um, you know, I think, I think that the framing of it as, well, we, we sort of check that box is, is not necessarily productive in the sense that it is the market and the willingness to invest and build this housing that's going to get us, the, that historically has gotten us the most volume, and to the extent that we can overbuild and have more capacity provided by the market, what, whatever the state's top-down target is on some seven-year centrally planned <laughs> target, which is, which is great and all, you know, if we can attract investment and build dense, and if we could have 50,000 more people living in high-rises in downtown because the market demand was there and the financing was there and it all lined up, that would be a great thing. And we would, we would have a much better balance of supply and demand and We'd be hundreds and hundreds of percent, a thousand percent over our target, but that would be a great thing. So, you know, and I also just want to note, I mean, I think there's some real benefits of encouraging that market rate housing that we just shouldn't forget. And I'll just note a couple, and I know there are many others, but one is it does directly reduce displacement. And there's a lot of misinformation out there about this, but having more units ensures that higher income earning residents are spending less time and money bidding up the price of more naturally affordable housing stock 
that is out there because there is more availability of supply. And I do recognize that our vacancy rates around 7% for Class A, but that, that fluctuates. And the more that we overbuild market rate, the better from a kind of macro perspective in terms of availability of housing stock and prices. I'd also just note that market rate pays higher property taxes per acre as newer developments tend to be more dense and creates conditions for supporting transit and supporting walkable neighborhoods with vibrant retail, supporting our small business owners. And outside of at least downtown, actually pays affordable housing fees and generates one of the primary sources of revenue we have to actually go subsidize the building of affordable housing or includes affordable housing units in or next to the development. And so they're actually, they're very closely tied together. I, I actually think, it, just to offer a little more data and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues here, while I am also concerned about us missing our affordable housing targets, I, I do want to put this in perspective. We met 26% of our goal, which is pretty bad, pretty bad. All Bay Area jurisdictions together, there's 20%. So we were, we were the leader in many ways, one of the leaders in the entire region. Statewide, what was the statewide? Many other areas with lower land costs, lower cost of development. Statewide affordable housing production was 21% of goal. So while I think we need to do better in San Jose, I also think the fact that statewide we were at 21% of the goal, Bay Area wide we were at 20% of the goal, that, that we really need to be working with and working through our intergovernmental relations team to get the state legislature to be proposing reasonable goals, clear funding streams, and creating the conditions in which we can actually meet affordable housing targets because they're critically important, but to have a top-down mandate without the associated funding or other policy changes to make it possible is the reason that you see statewide failure, and in fact, we're scoring higher than virtually every other city, which is, and the numbers aren't good. Final point I just wanna make, and I'll just, bring this down to a question and then, and then open it up, is in this fifth RENA cycle, our total goal was 34,721 homes, which averaged needing to produce 3,986 units a year. We issued permits that got us to 2,700, so about two-thirds, a little more than two-thirds of what we needed, but 1,000 units per year less than what we needed. Unfortunately, that target pales in comparison to the upcoming cycle where the goal is 62,200 homes, which means starting this year, assuming our housing elements passed, we're gonna to need to be averaging 7,775 new homes a year. Now I know this is a little beyond the scope of this item, but I just wanna put that in perspective because we're about to be way behind goal on everything. Market rate, afford. So when we talk about needing to move the needle and take big swings and fundamentally change outcomes, I just wanna flag for the council that we're gonna to need to do some very dramatically different things if we're gonna be even close to being on target with either market rate or affordable as we've actually seen permits decline over time. So I don't know, staff, if, if you, maybe a little beyond the scope of this item, if you wanna comment at all on what we have learned from this cycle and how we are applying that. I know you had a slide in there highlighting a few kind of marginal changes we've made, but how do we hope to go from what's been a slow decline to couple thousand permits a year to needing to get back to about 8,000 units a year. That is a 4X change in a cycle that's only going to give us, what, seven years to achieve it. So just to start with an easy question. Let me start with that, Mayor, and I'll hand it over to Michael. So Chris Burton, Director of Planning, Building Code Enforcement, and certainly that's a fair question. Um, when we look historically, certainly over the last uh, 20 years on housing production, it, it's not even getting back to, right? I think our peak in 2013 or 2014 was, sort of, yeah, between sort of four and 5,000 units a year. So, I mean, it is an in incredibly large goal. The other thing I would add, just for context, is I think over the last um, four years we've seen certainly some of the most aggressive legislation out of the state around housing production, um, and that, that's made significant changes to the way that we do business and interact with that. And yet still, we're looking at 1,700 units produced over the last year. 
Um, so, you know, we have to acknowledge that fundamentally the biggest challenge around development right now is the economics. Um, the sheer cost per unit of both market rate and affordable units is working against us. Um, as we continue to sort of make that transition uh, citywide around the kind of density and a, a different type of product. Um, so, you know, we, we definitely acknowledge that as we look at the new housing element that we're working on and that we'll be happily bringing back in June. Um, you know, we, we're looking to learn from both this housing element and some of those bigger changes to see what we can apply locally. Um, and then I would just continue to point to some of the bigger work that we're doing as a CSA around understanding the costs of development and how we impact them at different levels. Um, and then sort of how we think about our total structure of cost within the city as well. Um, because, you know, these are all the pieces that are going to need to change uh, for us to get anywhere close to 8,000 units a year. Michael, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think it's worthy of a much deeper dive at some point and really thinking outside the box and much more aggressively about streamlining, reducing fee. I mean, we're going to have to think much we have to think very differently, I think, um, and I don't quite know what that means. But um, I just want to add one thing. Yeah, though. sure, Michael. Um, so I think one thing we have to think about is, you know, a lot of our uh, housing units are really focused on, on higher density, which we do still need to do. But there is a question about are there opportunities for that missing middle housing type, which is a smaller puts you know development in the hands of smaller scale builders. Um, some of the studies we've done recently, although we have to would have to revalidate them under the current market conditions, is that there are places in San Jose where those type of products would be feasible and come in at a less expensive, I don't want to say affordable, but less expensive rent and um, for sale price. So I think we have to start looking at other tools in the, t in the toolbox that we haven't been using and other product types and see where they might fit in San Jose. Um, so we have, we sort of have many horses in the race to get us to that larger number. Yeah, appreciate that addition and boy, I have some concerns. I, I would say that uh, what we've seen with ADUs validates your point there. Okay, let's continue with discussion. Ah, for the first time after I spoke, hands went down. All right, Councilmember Batra. <clears throat> Mayor, I was going to say a couple of comments very similar to what you started with that Affordable our market rate uh, units, 115%. Uh, What's our specific thing we did that, that it made 115%? Is there anything, that's purely a market play, right? Yeah, I mean, our general plan plans for a, a significant amount of what I call medium, some people call it higher density development, um, you know, four, five, six, seven stories. Um, and uh, those units are, are, those are above moderate income. Those are market rate units. Um, and for a period of time, we were very successful in building those because as Chris alluded to, the marketing economics were different up until about three, or, three years ago or so. And those type of products would actually pencil. Um, we still are having some projects built. We're still getting a lot of entitlements because I think there's a lot of um, optimism that the market conditions will will return in the near future, and the and that projects will uh, be able to get financing and be positive and move forward. But it's really that we provided the the policy and ordinance framework within the city to allow that type of housing happen. And what we found over the last three years or so is that we're really challenged with um, forces that are many ways out of our control, which is the cost of, of, of materials, the cost of labor, the overall cost of construction, as well as more recently, interest rates have been going up significantly, which impacts the financing of projects. And, and I would add, there are things that we learned where we really tried to move very quickly to respond to market rate developer concerns. So one example is, you know, we created the opportunity, even, in, even to the extent where we created an ordinance to allow for a very specific type of market rate housing that was supposed to be shared housing uh, that actually did not go forward. So um, it ended up that whole need or demand for that product type collapsed um, before one building was developed in San Jose. So there were lessons learned both in success and lessons learned, I think, in uh, perhaps responding to something that truly didn't have a market um, 
where a market has collapsed since that. Thank you. Uh, like the mayor said, that we should encourage, actively encourage, as many market rate uh, units can come on the market. Because if we don't, even though we exceeded our rate 115 percent, but our demand is still higher. Okay, and if the demand is higher, the market rate rent will increase. And if the market rate rent increases, we're going to have more people going to have to be put into the affordable category because the market rate rent has gone beyond what their income can support now. Okay, so, so we will be just like we've been talking about homelessness situation. If we don't build enough of those market rate rents uh, units, we'll be pushing people into that affordable category from being in the uh, market rate rent category. So, so I think we shouldn't uh, take our eye off that, that we should encourage as much as development of the uh, market rate rent uh, units come so that the market rate rent don't increase too much beyond our control, okay? So actually, there are studies. Um, there was a study recently done by the Turner Center. So um, while building market rate housing is important, and I don't think our response on um, we created more market rate was not intention was not intentional to say that that was bad. It was to say, look how great and successful we were. But the belief that prices will go down because we're building enough on the market rate site that will impact the affordable is just not accurate because the pricing just can't get down sufficiently in order to create the type of affordable housing that we're required to build. Uh, under the housing element. And so oh. even though we continue to build yeah. market rate housing, where that will impact the market is on that moderate side, where we still have definitely a group of people who are having housing challenges. So when more people who have wealthier incomes move into that new housing, they're gonna open up housing stock for moderate income people. They're not gonna be opening up housing stock for no. low income or very low income. No, no I, I think my point got missed. I was saying the other way around, that if you don't build enough market rate rents, the rents will go up, and as a result, somebody who was today, based on their income, was able to rent a place on a market rate rent, they would need to look for an affordable rent because the now the slab would have moved up. So my point was the opposite of what it came across, okay? So I'm saying that please do go ahead and continue to build as many market rate rents unit are available to build. Do not discourage that. Don't get in the way of getting those built. Now, this, so if that point is clear, then I can move on to my second point, okay? All right, so the second point is, I think whatever the number of unit the state assigns, to some extent it's immaterial. We in San Jose know that the number of units in the affordable category we need is a lot more than what we have. If we met 26% and we are better than 20% by anybody else, all it tells is that we are still 74% short of what we probably need or maybe even need more than that because that's a number assigned by the state which is a fictitious number in a way. It's not based on the exact need we have. Our need is a lot higher. So we are 74% below of that. Actual need might be even 80%, 90% more than that. So I think we need to have some more innovative plan because at the moment, whatever we are doing is all good, but it's not sufficient. It's not going to get there. We heard it in many different ways from the public, from the mayor, from me, from everybody else we meet on the street, okay? I mean, you're absolutely right that, just to clarify how they come up with the number, the number is based on a projection on the need for future affordable housing. <laughs> what it absolutely does not capture. So in this cycle, we miss 75% of the units. So it doesn't go forward and say, okay, San Jose, you need X 
plus the 75% that you missed. It's just you missed that and they're moving on. Yeah. So it is definitely a number that is under represent under represents the exact number of units that we need. So you are 100% correct. Right. Yeah. So and 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 you know it better than anybody else who lives this reality every day that unless something changes at probably city level, county level, state level, we are not going to get there because there are the the path is full of obstacles, if you want to call it, and as a result, we will not get there. So we like to see in next report what are you doing differently, or what do you want this council or mayor to go and preach at the state level or our congressmen who are coming and saying, hey, we want to help you guys. Let's take something concrete to them to say, help us with that. I, I know you guys have tried those, but I'm going to just going to make the plea that let's come with that so that we can try it again and see if we can remove at least one obstacle out of your way in getting the thing done. Okay? Thank you. Thanks, Councilmember. I did just want to note, um, Jackie, on the Turner Center report, uh, completely agree that new market rate housing is not going to do anything for folks who, or will do very little for folks who need that, that um, extremely low income, how affordable housing. However, in the long run, I do think supply plays a critical role in that so much of our affordable housing today was built by a private developer 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. And so in the long run, supply can age into greater levels of affordability because the cost base is so much low when you project out decades later. So I just wanted to clarify that. I think you're right in the short run about that. Yes, you're right. Decades later, it will make an impact, but in the short run, it will sure. and we not need have more, that effect. We need more immediate solutions, but part of why we're in this mess is that we slowed down market rate production and are seeing a 2030. We're seeing the effects of the last 20 years of underbuilding market rate. Um, okay, Councilor Dewan. Thank you. Um, thank you, staff, for your hard work. And I, I agree with both the mayor and, and um, our council member, Arjun Abatra. We have supply and demand. And, and, and when there's less supply, there's not enough competition. So when there's not enough competition, then the rates continue to go up. And if that was the case, a lot of renters become unable to get to pay the rent. Therefore, they'd be subsidized, right? And so we build affordable housing versus market rate housing, and we go this circle. And so it's come to my question is this, what can we do to build more market rate housing um, that would lower the cost across the board? Yeah, I mean, I think, as I, we mentioned before, a, a lot of the cost of the type of housing that we're planning in San Jose is very, very expensive. And frankly, there's not much that we as a city government can do to lower those costs. We can always talk about how we can better to do the stream, how we can do better to streamline the process. And those are things we're thinking about, which will be in our next <clears throat> draft housing element that you will see. Um, but again, I think it's also, it, you know, thinking about other types of market rate housing that we're not building, that maybe there may be places for it in the city that it could move forward that might be at a lower price point um, and, 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 and would be uh, feasible in times such as now where the higher density stuff is, is not because of the cost of construction. And that's that's something that is addressed in our housing element, which we will bring be bringing to you in June. Okay. Well, affordable housing is housing which is subsidized by the government through the taxpayer by increasing tax taxes on properties, goods, and other area. If we increase the amount of affordable housing in San Jose, we will increase the demand on subsidy from our taxpayer. More housing means more money is needed. Once those funds um, runs out for construction of properties, the rent has to uh, continue to be subsidized. So what, pers it's just that we're, we're going this vicious circle. And, and so when all the affordable, affordable housing is gone and we subsidize all these 
renter and it is a larger amount than, than the market rate and the property is not paying as much taxes as market rate, how do we recoup, recoup that money? So all housing in the United States or 90% of housing in the United States is subsidized. So on the home ownership side, I'm sure many of you take a tax deduction uh, of your mortgage interest rate, and that is a cost that's borne by everyone, as in rental housing, that is a cost that is borne on the public, but it uses a different tax mechanism in which to uh, raise those costs um, or fees in order to support affordable housing. So there are multiple ways to produce affordable housing, and whether it's through uh, taxes or in, in you know the, our Measure E, where we have a transfer tax, um, there are federal housing vouchers. All of these programs are supported in different ways and use different mechanisms in order to raise money for affordable housing. Um, it's, it's part of our public policy because the market cannot build these units at a cost that is affordable to the income ranges in which we're targeting. And if they could, they would, but they can't and uh, in order to achieve the profit that they need to in order to build housing. And so, you know, I think it is just a reality of the circumstances of which we find ourselves in, in on the rental side, which is there is a market failure and therefore a role for government to support the production of housing so that everyone has a place to live. So what I'm hearing is that, that our homeowners are being subsidized as well? Our absolutely homeowners are subsidized by your mortgage interest tax deduction. If you paid that tax deduction, instead of getting that break on your taxes, then we would have more money in the federal government to provide for other services. Would you say that subsidy in taxes equal to amount that we subsidize affordable housing? Actually, according to the federal government, the overwhelming majority of tax deductions go to homeowners and to the highest income owners, homeowners, than the rental subsidies that are provided via government support. No, I, I, my, my question is, is the amount of tax deduction from property owners, correct? equal or more than the affordable housing that we spent to subsidize? Overall, the homeownership, support for homeownership in this country and the tax breaks that are provided to them are much greater than the support that's provided to renters and the building of rental housing. So it sounds like maybe we all should just sell homes and be subsidized, I guess, and, and an apartment complex. I don't think that would be a great answer. But anyway, you know, last week the, the council were told that Measure A fund were depleted and, and the city have to, you know, give in an additional $12.25 million to construct units at uh, 797 Almaden. In this memo, it's, it's quoted that in addition to city funds, Santa Clara County Measure A funding in San Jose new developments is still available, but is time limited, given a remaining balance of $49 million in Measure A. That's on uh, um, page 14. So is there still funding in Measure A? If so, why did you ask for council to approve the $12.25 million for 797 Almaden last week? So the county makes their decisions, funding decisions, on how much they are able to support in each affordable housing development. And they have an affordable housing plan. Um, and that was the limit to how much they were willing to support for that previous uh, development. They have funds available. And those funds are being directed outside of the city of San Jose 
um, because they have met their affordable housing goal of the number of units that they had planned uh, to build in the city of San Jose. And so as a region, we want, a, you know, the county wants affordable housing built throughout the county. Well, we still have $49 million. Why didn't we use that versus asking the city to fund it? I'm sorry, could you clarify that question again? So the, the question is that you have a remaining balance of $49 million in Measure A, right? On page 14? Why did you ask the city to fund the other 12.25 million? Because we have to come in and get a specific funding commitment to a development. So whether we have money available in any of our funding sources, um, I guess I'm just confused about the question. We would come to you to say, here's a gap and we need help in funding the gap. Yeah, I didn't realize it was $49 million. Let's say you have $100 in your pocket and you're, you're uh -huh. asking me for $20. It, it doesn't make sense because you still got $100 in your pocket. Would you use that $100 or you just ask me for $20? Again, I don't, the city doesn't have control over the county's Measure A funding. The county makes its decisions and how it wants to fund. We believed that it potentially could have funded more, but because they have used um, the overwhelming majority of their funding in San Jose, the county made a decision to limit the funding and has very little funding available for projects in San Jose um, because they have a goal to provide affordable housing countywide. So did you propose that to the county to, to get more funding or did you just assume? We always work very cooperatively with the county. It's one of our strongest partnerships is within the housing department, between the housing um, and the Office of Supportive Housing. And yes, we continually work with them to ensure that they're investing as much as possible. And it's also very important to note, they pay for 100% of the ongoing services needs of that particular development. So they're paying for ten to $12,000 per unit in addition to the construction cost for the services that are provided on site when we do permanent supportive housing. Well, thank you, my time is out. Thank you, let's go to Councilor Torres. Great, thank you, good evening. Uh, thank you all for, for this uh, presentation. It's uh, um, very, very concerning, especially when we are not building enough affordable housing for the crisis that we are in. Uh, I just have a few questions and now I'll, I'll try to make them uh, as quickly and brief as possible. Uh, so one of them is, will revisiting our commercial linkage, linkage fee help us with our RENA goals? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Will revisiting our commercial linkage fee help us with our RENA goals? Um, again, if you were to relook at the commercial linkage fee, I mean, we, by uh, increasing it, obviously. By, okay, by increasing <laughs> sorry, it. Sorry, thank you, sorry about that. You know, uh, clearly one of the things that we will continue to need is um, funding in order to help support the gap that all of affordable housing needs. And whatever funding source you would ch choose uh, to increase in order to fund the gap would be helpful. But there are always limitations to all of these programs and we certainly did look very closely and the commercial linkage fee, and um, you know that has its own limitations. Great. So, hey, is, is, that, is that a yes? Well, can, if, if, <laughs> I can just, if I need to add to that one, obviously, um, you know, we use a variety of tools to support affordable housing, and we're looking at you know all of those uh, models to ensure that we have the most funds available. The challenge I think we see currently with uh, sort of you know significantly revisiting the commercial linkage fee is our commercial and office development is uh, stagnant, right? There's really not right. a significant market for it. Um, it's under a significant amount of pressure already. And so um, I think that's one of those considerations that as we look at that, we'll have to really think about you know, the, the balance because 
even with the, the current fee, um, you know, if we can seed and sort of see the opportunity for more commercial development, that will generate revenues. If we tend to push the economics on those developments, then we'll potentially see less money over time. So, it, you know, very much uh, sort of understand the need to appreciate all the tools that are in the, the toolbox, um, but that there's a fine balance in, in kind of how we proceed on that one. Great. And with that, I'm going to ask another question that has to do with development. Has the downtown high-rise incentive program, has that helped or hurt us with our arena goals? Well, unfortunately, down in downtown, for the high-rise development, we actually haven't seen high-rise break ground uh, since those original towers go forward. So, you know, in the downtown, we need, for the downtown to be su successful, we need housing. We need more residential development. And I think the overarching goal in downtown is to get as many people back into it and to activate it so that it can be thriving. So you have to balance that policy decision of how do we get something that will bring more residents to the downtown that we desperately need with our affordable housing goals. Um, and our exemption at this point was an attempt to at least get anything back moving on the market rate side. Uh, to the extent we were to see market rate high-rise development begin to boom, then I think that would be the appropriate time for us to say, okay, maybe it doesn't need this affordable housing reduction anymore because we're seeing things breaking ground. I think right now we're just not seeing that. So right. I don't think it, personally, I don't think it helps or hurt at this point because the cost is so much more expensive than the rents that they can achieve. It's not the affordable housing fee that's stopping that development, but Great. it's just a, an entire market that has collapsed. Great. And uh, second to last question, I, I promise. Uh, so interim housing, does that count towards our arena goals? Tiny homes? They do not. Just to interject, there's a bill in the state legislature today that would count them in the arena goals for the next cycle. So that is not yet state law, but that's currently making its way through the legislature. Okay, great, thank you. And then lastly, because um, I know this is a very complicated uh, issue and of concern, and it's a crisis. In our next housing element, which is obviously coming up, uh, what can we do better to meet our housing goals? And um, can you speak to statewide efforts to hold cities accountable in meeting those goals? I think the mayor just mentioned one, but what are others? Well, I would say one of the things the state has done to help us is with the streamlining. And I know that sometimes for council members that can be challenging because it doesn't require all that public process that we would typically go through but the streamlining has reduced the time that develop, affordable housing developments have spent in getting to the, over the goal line of actually beginning to build in housing. So that has been one tool that has been very effective in producing affordable housing faster. And, and that's actually a tool that we're proposing to expand for market rate housing in our housing element that you'll be seeing in June. So we're, we're taking an approach that's worked really well at the state level and want to expand it within San Jose. Okay, great, thank you. Great, thanks Council Member. Council Member Candelas. Thank you, uh, I, I wanna thank staff for the presentation. Uh, I hope you're ready for another uh, mortgage interest deduction question, Jackie, I, I'm full of those. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I, I, but what, what could we attribute our lack of uh, meeting our affordable housing target, you, you, the biggest attribution? I'd say the lack of, um, well, not having enough funding is one of the uh, challenges of meeting our affordable housing, whether it's the local gap. Um, at some point, if we were to have a tremendous amount of local gap, there also would be a stall um, with the amount of tax credits that are available that kind of also define how much affordable housing can get through the process at any given time. Um, and, you know, right now, the advantage that affordable housing has over market rate is that affordable housing can go forward because market rate housing right now is stalled uh, in San Jose because they cannot generate 
the rents needed in order to build the product. So this creates a huge opportunity for affordable housing now to acquire sites that market rate developers may be willing to let go of because they can't go forward. Typically, we haven't had the funding. It's been kind of reversed when we're in these cycles of when market can't go uh, forward, then we don't have enough money to kind of grab what's available. And so that's kind of the delicate balance of, of, the, of our world in affordable housing. Okay, thank and you. Council Member, I'd just add to that, you know, um, as we look forward to the new housing element, we're exploring new land use solutions as well that kind of account for that. So particularly as we look at North San Jose and the redistribution of residential capacity in that area, we're looking at affordable only housing overlays, right? That again, helps shift that market dynamic for land that's available purely for affordable housing. So they're not competing with, you know, market rate development that can usually come in at a higher price on that land. Thank you, Chris. I, I appreciate that follow up. And, you know, to, to a couple points, I think 26% it, you know, of, of the target that we're hitting um, for affordable, it, it's abysmal, and that's, I don't think that's, anybody on this, on this dais would, would say, you know, we should be proud of that, comparing ourselves to other Bay Area neighbors who, you know, have historically a, a you know, a bad rap for, for uh, putting up barriers to, to this type of development. Um, is, is, is not something we should aspire to in regards to naturally occurring affordable housing. There's obviously there's issues with waiting for market rate housing 30, 40, 50 years to eventually become affordable because of soft story issues that, that we have to deal with now that become seismically unsafe and historically disenfranchised communities are predominantly the ones who are living in these uh, affordable, naturally affordable housing units now. Um, so as, as just one, one of the points I want to make, and I think we should do what we can and not forego our responsibility as city leaders to strive to meet our, our arena targets, not just in this cycle, but in future cycles. So thank you. Councilor, I don't think we disagree, but if we're beating the state, the statewide average by nearly 30%, I think it's pretty clear that there's a uh, structural issue statewide with the way we're setting up these arena goals. And there's, there's much broader structural issues at play if uh, we're, performing abysmally, as you say, which I agree with, and yet uh, leading the pack. So I, it's not comparing us to Los Altos, it's comparing us to all the other big cities in the state. Um, okay, so we are almost there. Count, Vice Mayor Kamei. Thank you. Um, thank you for um, the progress report. I, um, I was just wondering, you know, at the end of the day, we know that it's all about money. It's just so expensive to build. Um, and I was just curious as to whether as to whether or not there has been any attempt to at least um, go out and and purchase the land and you know have um, a partner um, affordable housing developer come in afterwards because I mean you Jackie, you mentioned there are some opportunities now, but um, I was just thinking that having control of one of the factors, which is, you know, the high price of what it costs for the dirt, is, um, is one of the variables that, you know, I mean, the price keeps going higher and higher and higher. Just when you think, oh, my gosh, you know, it's going to level off or it's coming down or, you know, people are not building, so it's going to come down. It doesn't, you know. So, I mean, it's just expensive, right? And it only gets more expensive. So by, you know, doing something like purchasing the land, uh, you at least have some control over what happens there. Uh, so I was just wondering, I mean, I know that there are a lot of tools uh, to support affordable housing. And I think they, that everyone has tried every which way. And I'm just curious, everyone has tried every which way. And I'm just curious as to, you know, whether or not you've ever gone, you know, the purchase of land route. So in affordable housing, we typically think of that strategy as land banking, where we would might go out aggressively yeah. and just purchase land. And sometimes that is a uh, needed strategy. And I would say in this time right now, 
it is probably not needed because we have so many active affordable housing developers in this area that are looking for land and looking for sites that they can do it much faster than we can and that if we purchase it, it doesn't make it faster because we have to go through environmental reviews, I have to come to council, put it on an agenda, get your permission, I have to talk to you, you want me to do a community process. It is gonna be more expensive, more time consuming if you have me do it. And then once I do it, I gotta create an RFP, I gotta hire consultants to do this and that, and then I gotta release it, and then I gotta review the people's responses, and then Okay, never mind. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I don't know these things, right? Uh, but but I, I think, I guess what I, what I was thinking about is, um, you know, sort of like looking at alternative ways of getting to the place where we want to get to. Because I do know, I, I'm, I'm not sure how we get around controlling some of the factors that make it exorbitantly expensive. I mean, it just is. I mean, even if we cut the fees and we make it easy and all of that, that's just like one part of it. There's so many other parts of it that, uh, you know, because you start the materials and the this and the that, and who, who else has to, like, cobble up the, 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 uh, the funding to be able to make it happen. So I just, I just think that as we move forward and we're looking at all these different things, you get to a point where we've done everything. I mean, even if we were to say, okay, we're not going to charge, everything is going to be, you know, like we're not going to charge for anything it's still gonna cost a lot, right? So even if we do our part, how do we get other factors to, to move? Because if not, we're still gonna be at the 26%. And what I wanna remind you is that, was it last week or the week before, you gave us direction to come back and look at the cost of affordable housing and really think through, like, where are all the levers that we can impress upon and try to drive the cost down? And if it's not us driving the cost down, you also asked us, the mayor specifically asked us, then look to see what we can ask the legislature or the federal government, or is there somebody else who we can influence that has the ability to drive the cost down? So our commitment was we would come back to you sometime before August, but it, at least by August, re-looking at costs and really thinking very deeply on where are the different pressure points that we're seeing the cost and what and how can we influence that. And we will certainly engage our developer partners who always have ideas as well, and we wanna look to them. I mean. They're the experts in building. How can they help us to achieve these goals? So I promise you we'll be bringing that more back to you per your direction already to give you more in-depth understanding of those cost drivers. Well, I appreciate that. And with that, I move to accept the progress report. Second. Second. Thank you. Second by Councilor Torres. Okay. Uh, looks like we're going around for another round. I'd encourage my colleagues to keep it quick. It's almost nine o'clock. We've had quite a bit of discussion on this. And as Jackie just pointed out, we did just give direction to come back with research on this. Uh, thank you for that reminder, Jackie. Councilmember Batra. I think one comment which was just made uh, before uh, the housing director talked that we can't do anything about the costs. Uh, being whatever it is. Several published studies and anecdotally talking to some of the developers, they say our planning and our permitting and then inspections add at least 20% to the cost, okay? Now that, if you are able to expedite, improve, it certainly should add whether it's 20 and 19 or 16, I don't know the number. But those are the numbers which I've seen in the published report and some of the people who have approached us here about the San Jose, and they say San Jose is probably about the 
the most difficult to deal with, I was going to use a different word, but I withdrew it, okay, most difficult to deal with in terms of the planning, permitting, and inspections. You don't get an inspection for two months on a certain thing, you're adding to the cost slowing down on the activities. So please look into it. I don't want to get into any specifics here because I don't have any particular project I'm talking about. So I just want to leave generically with that, that please look into in your process improvements or whatever you're doing. General feeling is that we are adding to the cost because of the way maybe you short staff don't know all the explanations. Okay, so take that for whatever it is worth. Uh, that we need to find a way to do that one. The other comment which was made about the uh, affordable homes are going, but market rate uh, houses are not getting developed because of the cost and the economics. If that is not happening, the affordable homes are not getting, or the market rate rents are not getting built, soon we're gonna have even a bigger crunch on that one. That means the rents will increase and hence more people will need affordable rent rather than the market rate because they wouldn't be able to afford it anymore, right? So, so let's do whatever we need to do to make sure that the market continues to build the market rate rents, otherwise we will have a bigger population of the ones who needs affordable rate rents, okay? Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I want to thank staff again for the report. Thank my colleagues for the lively discussion. I know a lot of tough questions were asked, but I think it's really just a reflection of the urgency with which we all feel the need to build housing, which is really the, the most fundamental challenge we face regionally. Um, you know, I, I also want to thank my colleagues who offered very specific ideas and questions, even if, even if Jackie immediately shot down the vice mayor's idea. Um, I appreciate, you know, the thought of, hey, could we do this? Or Councilor Torres, while I disagree with some of the proposals, I appreciate the specific uh, point. I don't think any of us are advocating, uh, advocating our responsibility for building affordable housing, but when the entire state is missing the target by 80%, I think we have to acknowledge that there's some big structural issues, and I do think we're gonna have to bring down costs. And I think we're gonna have a responsibility at a city level for bringing down costs and time is money, by the way, and I think we're gonna have a responsibility to fight at the state level to remove barriers and find ways of bringing down costs and speeding up project delivery. So, um, with that, I think we, are, we have a motion, so we are ready to vote. Oh, wrong title. Are we still able to vote on this, or do we need to re- Yeah, it's fine. Tony's gonna count it, all right. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, approves the rec, that passes unanimously with, uh, from all present. Um, thanks to everybody for a long, productive meeting. We do still have open forum, please do not leave. We need to hear from members of the public who would like to comment on anything that was not on today's agenda. Paul? Mental health under the weight of your wealth, struggle striving for dignity. Our humanity under your apathy, our significance beneath your indifference, difference. Struggle striving for resiliency. I see, ears listen, let sentient hearts pray. For those with an obsession who welcome oppression to those living in San Jose. This poem was written, keeping in mind the people that are suffering the most that don't have the capacity nor the to come to these meetings and do what it is that I do. I think an affirmation of the very points that I had pointed out before that last item were affirmed. They were affirmed by the complete disgusting way in which my mayor and everybody else tried to rationalize away those statistics. Blair? Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thanks a lot for the meeting today. Um, I'm interested how to talk about the concepts of uh, open public policies. And um, 
you know, the transparency work I do with tech issues is important. Uh, down in San Diego, uh, sorry if I made a little bit too big a deal about it earlier, but they're really working on a, uh, or on, on San Diego issues earlier, uh, but in San Diego, they're working on a, a PAB um, uh, technology uh, accountability board. And they've, and they've brought on some really good people so far. Good luck on how that effort can work. And I'm really gonna try to consider and talk about uh, open public policy ideas in the next few weeks and what that can mean in our beginning new stages of a new administration and council. And uh, thank you for your patience now. <laughs> and now I'm gonna try to talk about the issues. Thanks. Back to council. Thank you. We're adjourned. Have a good evening.